So today I'm chatting with British writer and researcher Neil Sanders. He's qualified in film studies, media production and psychology, and he's also a qualified hypnotherapist. So I'm sure we're going to have a pretty good chat today. How are you doing today, Neil? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me on. Good to chat to you. So as you point out in your books, uh, I've just finished reading your volume two of Your Thoughts Are Not Your Own, by the way. Uh, as you point out in your books, people often think of mind control as something that's done on an individual basis, a sort of one-on-one yeah. -on -one basis. Uh, but it's actually being done to all of us on a collective basis all of the time, and it has been pretty much from the moment we first came into the world, hasn't it? Well, pretty much. I mean, the, the, the thing is, I mean, it's not really as sort of paranoid as it sounds, really, to assume that essentially there's a status quo and they quite like the way that it is and they like being in charge and stuff like that so it's, it's, not, un, it's not unreasonable to assume that powerful people have consolidated their, their position and wish to maintain this position and one of the, the particular ways that they do this is, is the setting of roles and the setting of norms through society I mean if you want to get down to the, sort of the, the brass tacks of the academic nature of it it's Edward Bernays or it's Walter Lippmann and it's either engineering or manufacturing consent which is basically defining what is acceptable in society, defining what is normal behaviour, the way to act, and, and, and basically ridiculing anybody that, that seems to act out of that or, or sort of really deriding them or you know, very, very publicly coming down on them like a ton of bricks uh, as deviants. Anybody that sort of goes out of the normal sort of realms of society or starts questioning uh, held beliefs or held structures of society, you're a deviant or you're a troublemaker or you're, you know, you're a dissident or, or something yeah. like that. And that's another aspect of mind control is, is, is the use of language, the very use of language. I mean, we could be termed as conspiracy theorists, but that in itself, I mean, George Carlin does an excellent bit about that, that since when did, a cons what, did, when did the concept of a conspiracy could become something to um, ridicule. People conspire all the time. Mm. You know, there is a crime against conspiracy, conspiracy to murder, conspiracy to commit fraud and such like that. So how is it so unusual, the concept that basically people in powerful positions would conspire to consolidate power? But, you know, that's the way that it's, it's done. You're, to quote George Carlin, you're a, you're a nut, you're a kook, you're a conspiracy buff. Yeah. Very interesting point about the setting of norms in society as well, what's deemed acceptable. Yeah. Uh, everyone goes along with this, but it's always somebody else's norms and somebody else's idea of what's acceptable. You know, it's never the general public that set these norms, and yet they, no. they, they go along with them unquestioningly in most cases. And just, just a few that occur to me. When you really look at these aspects of society and really mm. break them down to their common core, they're completely ridiculous, and yet we put up with them. One is the concept of war, the yep. idea that uh, if you have a disagreement or a beef with uh, another country, the way to resolve it is to bomb the shit out of them and, and to drop bombs on innocent civilians yep. uh, who are just called collateral damage. It's just one of those things. Most people in this country go along with the idea that we have to have wars to protect us and to keep us safe, because that's the lie that they've been sold. Mm -hmm. Then you have taxes we all have to pay taxes. When you actually look at it, it's robbery. Yes. <laughs> the establishment is taking money from you against your will, and they put you in jail if you object to it. And yet we accept this. It's completely outrageous. It's completely ridiculous. But because it's been sold and packaged to us as just one of those things, death and taxes, you know, mm. we all just accept it. And the other one, it occurs to me, is the royal family, the queen. <sighs> You know, we in this country support one particular family on the basis of their genetics, their bloodline, and that alone. None of us can be king or queen. Uh, you can't be king or queen if you happen to be black or a person of colour. Uh, and you can't well, be king or queen if, if you happen not to be a Protestant Christian, or at least on the surface. Let's just examine that concept of the royal family, what you've just said. Like, mm. okay, The genetic disposition to be the rulers and such like that. Yeah. If you said basically, right, so the, the, the fact is or the premise is that because of their specific genetics or their specific DNA or their specific bloodline, they're entitled to something. Hmm. Isn't that the flip side of saying that because of your genetics or your DNA or your skin colour, you're not entitled to something? Yeah. 
because you know essentially to me that seems the same thing one particular uh, element of, of society um you know genome or whatever you want to call it gets favored uh, because of that mm. uh, that appears to be the same principle as essentially you can't sit at the fr at the front of the bus because yeah. you're black it's an inherited it's, it's an inherited uh well it, it's systematic wisdom, injustice so and it's systematically um I mean, it's, it, it, it is the class system, obviously. It, it, it's an unfair distribution of wealth. It's ridiculous. I mean, there was this thing recently saying, oh, the, the Queen is having to, you know, she's almost bankrupt or some nonsense or rubbish that was in the Daily Mail saying that she'd, she'd really felt the pinch. Well, sell a seabed or two then. You well, know, she's this got is plenty. the point. She's got 660,000 million acres. She she's owns more land than, than anybody else on the planet. Mm. Uh, I have heard, I don't, I don't know if this is true, but the, the Prince Charles's conglomerate interest means that essentially he owns 75% of all the food that's manufactured and sold in the world. Mm. But it, again, it's, it's, it's concepts, it's this mm. idea, like, like you said, basically this concept that's always been there and so it will always be there, so nobody questions it. It's can, just like, can, you, can you imagine, we've got this particular bloodline that's in place as royalty because it's been inherited over generations, but supposing it was announced tomorrow that uh, Mr and Mrs Jenkins of... Park Road, Stoke-on-Trent, were going to be uh, the new royal family. They were going to be elevated to this position of great wealth and power, going to be given mm -hmm. palaces, and we all pay for it. I think the general public will probably say, well, who are these people? Why are they so special? Why is it Mr and Mrs Jenkins of Stoke-on-Trent? This is mm. outrageous. We're not having this. But that's yeah. exactly what's happening with this one particular family. And well, because it's, it's been done over generations, it's And acceptable. the framing of it as well. This is it. It's the, the framing of it as an institution and, and as a... Uh, uh, as a real benefit to, to people as well. I mean, it, it's, it's nonsense. It's like, I mean, that's one of the things that, that that's so sort of oxymoronical about people that are very, very sort of royalist and um, mm. consider themselves to be patriotic. It's been a long, long time since the royal family have actually been English. You know, this <laughs> German or yeah. Dutch or... This is true. You know, Sliceberg, Hesse's, Saxe Coburg, Gothas and yeah, yeah, stuff yeah. like that. It, it, it again, it's it's a frame device and it, it's nonsensical, really. Wave a bloody uh, German flag. At least it's more appropriate. Well, you know exactly. I mean, it it is it, it is very very daft. Uh, but you know, that's the point. It, it's framed in such a way that basically. Um, people have a misunderstanding, which is exactly the same sense as taxes, because basically if you say, oh, I don't want to pay for this tax, or I don't want to pay for this tax, people say, well, why? You've got to, I've got mm. to, and, you know, it's the sort of sheep mentality, that's how a sheepdog works, it, yeah. they, they don't essentially control the whole flock, the fear of being bitten makes the flock um, control itself, self-regulate, if you know what yeah, I mean. So yeah. if anybody acts up, it's the, it's the flock that goes, stop it, you know, you're going to get us all into trouble, what yeah, are you, you doing? You can't be different. Exactly, but I mean, the, just the understanding of what taxes actually pay for, and um, the the usual answer is everything. Taxes pay for everything, but but they don't because you know there's specific channels for different taxes, and what income tax actually goes towards paying is is not what people. That's the one. Just like what what does income tax go towards pay for? And people say, oh, it goes towards paying everything, roads, street lights, schools, and stuff. And it's, no, it doesn't. Like there are there are separate delineations of tax that go towards covering that. As far as my understanding goes, income tax pays the interest on the debt to the banks. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's that's strictly accurate, but it's certainly what I've heard. Um, but again, it, it's a perception. It's like you said, this has always been here, this is inherent, this is mm. one of the things that you, you would never question. Yeah. And then just to sort of tie it back to your very first point about war, I mean, that's a big topic because it involves a lot of mind control. It involves the mind control of two groups, the people who are actually going to go out there and do the killing, you've got to sort of train them, you know, basic training, break them down, build them back up as a, as a killing machine, get them to stab bayonets into sacks of flour and stuff so that they, they can actually do these, these acts which aren't, you know, inherently sort of easy to a lot of people. Mm. Uh, and then there's the second group which basically is, is the player who tacitly approve of it, not rejecting it or by not... Or, and that can often be by, you know, very, very sort of broad sways. I mean, the, the Iraq war, there were a lot of people that realised that the, the WMD concept was nonsense and that a lot of the, the stories that were coming out were propaganda and they could actually see through this, but it was the concept that, you know what, though, Saddam is a bad guy, he's the butcher of Baghdad, he's la, 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 la. So in a lot of people's mind, that alone justified it because essentially we're going in there to get a bad man. 
and, and you know the the word collateral damage that that's that's from Tavistock. That is, it's the it's to soften off war so that people don't understand the brutal, ugly reality of it. And you know that if you said dead children, <laughs> it, it, it hits home a lot more than if you yeah. say, "Oh, the collateral damage today was a thousand. Um, but and, it's, and again, it's all different structures that are all set up there to to make it to make it justified. And it's painting of pictures of manufacturing of consent with war. The position is usually that regardless of the lies and propaganda, etc., 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 we're still the good guys. Yeah. We might be misguided and we might have m maniacal leaders or something, but ultimately on paper we're the good guys. Mm. That, that's, that's always how it's, it's presented because you couldn't really get people to, to fight. Yeah. Anyway, this concept of the royal family and you know, certain people just being elevated, that, it, I mean, this is, this is slightly glib, but it, it ties into things like the X Factor and the American Dream and, you know, getting on and becoming a success. Because if it can happen to them, it can happen to you. And so essentially they're your role model. And so the, the sort of justification for some people, and certainly, or the, the, the societal justification is you can't criticize any of these people because... If you are criticizing these people, it's just because you're jealous, because you haven't yeah. achieved what these people have, yeah, have done, go. regardless of the, the massively staggered hmm. playing field or, or whatever. You know, it's still that sort of element that, that it's your fault. Hmm. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, so you're a qualified hypnotherapist, and uh -huh. I'm sure with a lot of people, when you try and hypnotize them, a lot of people would probably say, Oh, you can't get me, mate. No, I'm I'm too smart for that. You can't hypnotise me, and uh, yeah. it's, it's, it strikes me that it's it's kind of that way when you suggest that people are being mind controlled as well. Oh on, yeah, on, yeah. On a mass yeah. basis, you get people saying, "Oh, they they can't get me that way. I'm too smart and streetwise. I'm in control of my mind." But what's happening, of course, is that like hypnosis, it's all done on a subconscious, subliminal level, mm -hmm. uh, targeting the subliminal mind. That's where it all goes on. And that's much harder to regulate unless you're fully aware of the tactics that are being used against you. Mm. Well, I mean, there is no way of regulating it because basically your subconscious mind has no critical analysis. Yeah. So, so basically, you know, that, that is how a lot of advertising and marketing... Yeah, this is how advertising and marketing strategies work and, and, and um, all sorts of things. Like um, as simple as just um, getting a celebrity to endorse a product... And on the face, consciously, you can understand that. You can see, like, this is a very obvious marketing strategy. You know, this is really, really obvious. I'm not going to fall for this. But your subconscious mind is watching this and going, you know, if I bought those trainers, I could be a little bit like Michael Jordan. <laughs> like, so, you know, because it, because it makes sense. Without the critical analysis, you're putting the two and two together and you're coming up with four. Hmm. Like, you know, he's got this particular, he's a very special athlete. He's got this particular special type of equipment. It must have some purpose otherwise you wouldn't use it yep. well, if I use it then maybe I can get some of that purpose hmm. and yeah I mean this is, that, that's certainly how it works and people could you know you're affected in, in a number of ways that people don't realize I mean um, just a presentation of any artist or musician or anything on the front cover it's all designed in a certain way to, to, to evoke certain feelings and to present a, hmm. an ideology you know, you don't really know if that person's... I mean, this is the thing, you know, <laughs> like, Biggie Smalls, he's wearing Versace suits and he's sat on a throne. He was flat broke when he died. Yeah. You know, one of the most talented artists ever, like, in that milieu, and didn't, you know, wasn't treated particularly nicely. So, again, yeah, it's, it, it is a, it's a subconscious thing, because a lot of these things consciously don't really make a lot of sense. Yeah. If these artists are really shipping all this coke of cocaine about and stuff like that, why are they talking about it in their songs? Yeah. Why, why, you know, how why are they, they not in the jail? Yeah, exactly. How have you got the time to do this? You know, surely yeah. you've been on tour and such like that. Yeah. But, but, you know, again, it's, it's, it's an idea that's sold to you. A lot of things are based on the concept of ideas, because... Really, they don't hold that much water when you when you start to examine them um, too greatly. I mean, let's just say the concept of like, you know, celebrity lifestyle. You can buy these certain products and make your house luxurious, your enormous house luxurious, and then you're doing well, aren't you? Well, maybe. But what people will find is that these products actually don't really seem so for some reason they don't actually 
fill that void, not mm-hmm. in the way that you expect him to do. And, and furthermore to that, you, you, you make a sort of lifestyle shift. You move up onto what could be called the next strata. More money, more problems. All of a sudden, you've got higher car payments. You've got yeah. higher monthly mortgage. Yeah. You've got a bigger house, so it takes longer to clean it. Yeah. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you, all this added stress that you've got from it is mm. defeating its own purpose because the whole point of what you do, of buying that product or buying that house or elevating yourself to that sort of level was to make yourself feel better. Mm. And lo and behold, it doesn't actually. Yeah. And that's the power of the subconscious mind, which is where it all goes on. Uh, I mean, I quite often find myself humming a tune, and I'm yeah. sure this happens to all of us. And you know, you, you suddenly become aware that you've got this tune going through your head, and you think, well, where where's that come from? And you think, oh, yeah, I remember hearing it on that radio station this morning, or it was on that ad I saw earlier. And sometimes it's a tune that I hate. It's, it's not even a record I like, and it's going through my head. Well, and, yeah, and, and that's the power ones, of it. They? Yeah. And it, this is what that's, I mean, that's the phrase that, that's used. I mean, this sound, again, I love this sounds quite silly, but when people realized that, that's essentially what sort of led towards the ruination of hip-hop to an extent, because rather than, say, a complicated eight-bar sample, if you've got a nice four-bar hook, mm. and particularly if you've got a nice four-bar hook that you've done on a keyboard so you don't have to actually pay any uh, um, release uh, costs to, to the original artist, yeah. uh, and then lo and behold, you can sell that as a ringtone. <laughs> like Soldier Boy made more money from ringtones than he's ever made from albums. Ringtone rappers. Mm. There you go. Lil John and uh, Two Chains and all this is—it's it, it sort of tying in with that to an extent with the sort of southern type of uh, hip hop. But mm. it—that's the thing, you know. The, the simplify the simplification of it, and the sort of um, there are numerous reasons for it that just so happen to sort of help other reasons. But it's, it's usually for a sort of commercial basis, really. Mm. Yeah, indeed. We'll get more into uh, so-called hip hop shortly. Sure, uh, but. Uh, I'm a DJ myself, I've been a DJ for over 20 years, and I used to make a joke about all this and just make light of it and have conversations with other DJs about it, and I wrote a book a few years ago and and did a whole chapter on this, DJ Requests. Um, It occurred to me quite recently, now that I'm looking into all these other areas of research, that in my job as a club DJ, I get to see firsthand the results of mass brainwashing and sort of mind manipulation Mm -hmm. of the people in the comments that punters make when they come up to the DJ booth. Uh, And this really makes you understand that their thoughts aren't their own. Mm -hmm. So these days, people only ever ask for whatever's in the charts or whatever's on MTV rotation. It's generally the same 15 to 20 artists ever. Rihanna, Beyonce, Flo Rida, Pitbull, Jay-Z, Kanye West, all the rest, Lady Gaga. They won't dance to anything they don't know. Yes. And they actually call you a shit DJ if you try and push boundaries and get creative with the music and you know serve them stuff they've never heard before. This didn't used to be the case. When I first started out 20 years ago, people would go and hear a DJ in a club and they would take the view that this guy knows his music, this yeah. guy's going to take us on a journey, let's see what he's got for us. But that, but the, that was the point, wasn't it, really? That's yeah. why the superstar DJ existed. Yes, to, you'd, to... you'd say, Pete Tong's in town, let's go and listen to a Pete Tong set, let's see what he's got for us. You wouldn't have gone up white to Pete... labels as well, wouldn't it? Because yeah, independent you would... white labels. So. Yeah, you wouldn't have gone up to Pete Tong and said, oh, Pete, can you play the number one single in the charts? But yeah. these days, people's idea of a great DJ is one that plays all the same tunes as everyone else in every other club, in every other high street, street, in every other town. Mm. And I've also noticed attention spans dwindling as well, to the point that if you don't change the record every minute and a half to two minutes, you know, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, switch, people start walking away. And and you can see them. They pick up their phones and start texting and walk off. You know, it's evidence of the instantaneous generation that wants everything right now Mm -hmm. and everything on their terms. And if that's not evidence of mass mind control, then I don't know what is. Yeah, I mean, it certainly is. I mean, like, one of of the things is that William Sargent, who was one of the first people, I mean, he published one of the first books on mind control, which is called Battle for the Mind, and he was the person that was involved in electroshock and LSD experiments and wiping people's memories in London at St. Thomas's Hospital. Um, Mm. He noted in his book that basically one of the... When he was looking into the, 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 the concept of, of mind control or manipulation, like he was looking at the sort of religious ceremonies and sort of indigenous religious ceremonies, and he noticed that basically 
the combination of sometimes drugs, but but always a sort of a rhythmical beating of drums because essentially it affects your heart rate. That's why people dance to dance music because the beat speeds up and and you know your heart goes along in time with it that's why you nod to hip hop and that's why mm. you know you sort of feel very aggressive to punk and metal and stuff because the the sort of the the groove of it is what sort of catches you so to speak yeah and so you know there, there is always that i mean what that that as an example of is we've got this thing called multi-screening and and information overload and it sort of ties into what you were saying before about the, the fact that people are, are flattered into believing that there's no way they could be fooled, yeah. you know, because they're so informed because they've got all these different channels of information. Yeah. Um, I mean, even without getting into the fact that, you know, there are 95% of these outlets are owned by exactly the same five or six companies. Yeah. Um, but, but it's more than that. The, the, the attention span thing comes from the fact that we're being bombarded with stuff and the fact of You'd think that with more competition, that would basically mean that television channels, for example, would be sort of bound to make better programs, and you're going to see a sort of an increase of quality television and, and stuff because obviously they've got all these rivals they need to compete. But what actually happens is basically they play it safe and go for the lowest common denominator and get the largest demographic share of the of the sort of viewing market. Yeah. And so instead, you get a whole 500 channels of dreck. And then to, to sort of further tie that in, and I think iPods do this to an extent, which is why I've not got an iPod. Um, if you sat there, I mean, everybody's done this. You sit there and it's like nine o'clock or whatever, and you think, right, okay, what's on? There's nothing particularly that I want to watch on. It's an old episode of Friends. There's a family guy that I've seen before. All right, we'll watch this. And five seconds into it, you're looking around all the other channels because you've got 500 channels available to you. Yeah, yeah, there must be something better than this. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? And so it breeds that dissatisfaction. And, and I've seen people do this on their iPods as well. You put it on shuffle and it's like, oh, I don't want to listen to that. 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 They're doing the shuffle themselves. Yeah, exactly. And it's the same thing when you... It's, this is a really weird thing that happens, <laughs> okay? You've, you'll have a, a, a film on DVD... Right, uh, Scum. Scum was on the other night. Okay, I've got that on DVD. I can watch that any time I want, but I just don't fancy it. But when it was on the telly, I thought, oh, brilliant! I'll watch this because it's on. Yeah, and it, it's that same psychological mean, yeah. process. It's very strange, but the more choice you're given, sometimes it, it just—it's kind of like an existential crisis. You know, it's the agony of decision. You've got all this stuff, and and the problem is that none of it's brilliant. So you're constantly. Thing, yeah, but it's it's presented to you as look at this, look at us. We live in the best of times. Car, imagine like oh, all those people from from yesterday and all those years before, in like the eighties when they were stupid and silly. Yeah. Like you know, oh, car. I could imagine that this is the finest of times, and and uh, woe betide anybody that was that, that doesn't live now because they're missing out. And it's yeah. it's not necessarily true, but that's the. That's the excuse that's been used since the dawn of time. I mean, look at the Great Exhibition and, and, and other uh, things like this. The, the point of those, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, the Seven Wonders of the World, the whole point of this is to remind the populace that you're actually bloody lucky, yeah. right? Because this is brilliant. Now it's not is so, great. Now is great, yeah. So, so stop complaining because, you know, it could be like it was backwards, which is strange because that, that's also combined with a, a sort of rose-tinted nostalgia nostalgia hmm. of oh yes but society was kinder in the old days and again this isn't necessarily true hmm. you know it's not true there's i forget who it was i think it's I, i'm gonna get this wrong but it's two figures historical figures like plato and socrates or something like that, and it's probably not those two people but it was it was from ancient greece and in this text they're talking about how teenagers today are so wild and unruly and like they're going to be the death and like they don't have respect for their elders like they did <laughs> and basically like this is the worst calamity that's ever ever happened mm. and that's always the case basically because yeah. you know I mean at one point one reason that that happens is because all of a sudden you, you don't become interesting to the there's a shift in the, the sort of societal role you move from being 20 to 30 and all of a sudden you're not economically viable to certain aspects so they're not going to tell you about um, the new music or the new fashion because A, you haven't got time, you've got kids and you're at work and B, they want to snare new uh, young kids for the market so all of a sudden you've got this sort of alienation and you feel sort of disparate and separate from what the kids are into 
but that's all right because basically they can market other things to you basically and, and they can also do that in a slightly sneering way of saying oh, these kids and blah yeah, blah yeah. so it's you know it's a shifting of roles but this is not new this is this has never been new there's always been sort of depictions of roles and the clever thing about it is is like say is it is done on a subconscious level and people just assume that that's that's always the way it is and that's the way that it should be why do people buy blue for boys and um pink for girls mm. it's because that's the way it is you know that's mm. that's the, the 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 thing but as i say you know pink for example it used to be an incredibly feminine color uh and and now it's not you know it's it's it's, it's actually um becoming more and more masculine because um you know you're getting the sort of again cameron and dipset and would popularize in pink <laughs> and then you, you know you're getting uh, other artists doing it, and then you're getting, you know, pink in fashion wear and, and such like that. So, yeah, it's strange. It's strange how these things can change. Yeah, really. And in 20 or 30 years, they'll probably be making TV shows about. Um I remember 2013. And people would be saying, yeah. "Oh, oh, look at what we used to wear then, and look at look at the bloody technology we used then. Wasn't it crazy how we used to live?" Well, I mean, <laughs> fashion is itself is that's another thing. It's always sold as organic, but is it any? You can just track back any historical. It, this is again, this is this sort of separation, this cognitive dissonance in people. You can look at, say, Russian propaganda, or you can look at Middle Eastern news, and you can go, "Oh, that's that's so biased. Oh, that's ludicrous." But you don't tend to apply that same logic to the things that you're presented with all the time because they're basically right up against your face. But look, let's just look at anything. Ruffs. Why was everybody wearing ruffs? At a certain point in, you know, Victorian England or whatever, then you know, cod pieces. There's always been a fashion that is dictated, and mysteriously, this fashion sort of tends to go worldwide. Hmm. Now, that's not some bloke that's come out one day and gone, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to wear a cod piece today, <laughs> uh, and then that somebody was walking past, like the the Elizabethan equivalent of, of Versace was walking past and went. Yeah, I can sell shed loads of them. Like, it's not how it works. It, it's presented. You see at the New York Fashion Week or whatever, essentially, look, next year, everyone's going to be wearing skinny jeans. We've said it. That's all we're going to be producing. And then mysteriously, you can't buy baggy jeans anymore or whatever. Do you know what I mean? It's not an organic thing. It's been dictated. But yeah. it is sold as an organic thing. That's what's so crazy because... It's very clever because the skinny fit jeans, for example, that kids are wearing now is a direct response to, say, the baggy jeans that 90s kids were wearing. Yeah. But the kids now think it's their own, not understanding that there's two things. There's, there's the dichotomy and the, sort of, like, the paradox of, of a uniform individuality. Hmm. And there's another thing that basically skinny fit jeans are, pre are prevalent in every single genre of music at, at present. So they're not distinct to metalers or punks. Yeah. They're not. They're you know. They're, or, now Drake's or, wearing them. <laughs> oh, for God's sake, and, and little Wayne, and wearing jeggings and leopard print jeggings and stuff like that. It's yeah. you know. Yeah. But again, this is a dictation of fashion. Yeah. It comes from the celebrity back onto the thing, and then you know. It's shocking to think that in twenty years, uh, kids, oh, today's kids that will be grown up then, will be looking back and saying, "Oh, do you remember two thousand and thirteen? Nicki Minaj. Oh, she was great. Little Wayne. Uh. He was fantastic." Jesus, God, the thought of that. Well, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I mean, that's just would, me. But that, that's, I mean, that's another thing. Is this is the sort of, it's a saturation of a market. There's no way that those artists could fail because mm. there, there is such a huge system and so much money behind them mm. that, you know, uh, they will tail off because, as I say, the problem is that your audience gets older mm. and such like that. Um, but it's sold as so enormous. Jay-Z, there's no way Jay-Z could fail because he's got this, image behind him, this portrayal, and it's again, it ties into sort of certain psychological instincts that you have that particularly when you're sort of in your formative years and stuff like that, you, you want to be associated with winners, you know, because these winners are doing well and again, it's like the sort of celebrity endorsement thing, if I very much observe these characters and I can figure out how they've achieved this, and I can in some way replicate that, then I can in some way be like them, and you know and maybe in the future if I take down enough and, and you know figure out the tricks and the rules to this game then I can succeed in the same way that they've succeeded yeah I remember in 2008 somebody was saying to me uh, there's this new artist that's due to come out called Lady Gaga yeah and she's going to be the next big thing she's going to be you know really big and I just remember thinking at the time how do you know yeah how, how, ca how can you know that she's going to be the next Madonna when she hasn't even put a single out yet because it yeah. was it was deemed and it was 
written that she was going to be the next big artist. It had been decided by the corporations behind her that she was going to be the next big superstar. And, of course, she was. And well, even before she came out, people were saying, oh, she's going to be the next big thing. I know yeah. this because I've been told. Well, I mean, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because that's the hype machine, isn't it? But then also, I mean, you must know this because of your sort of DJing work. This is very, very sort of... It's basically like payola. Uh, it still exists because you'll get a certain ra- record label will have an artist to push and they'll have cross-contamination on the, the board level with certain radio stations and certain television outlets and stuff like that and so they'll be able to position their artists to get played a lot on the uh, on the radio for example or, or whatever the more you get played on the radio because of the PRS the more money you get because every time it's played they owe you some money for the, the, the playing of, uh, of your music the more it's played the more people hear it Yep. The more people hear it, the more people are likely to go out and buy it or download it or whatever. Yep. The more people that hear it, buy it or download it, the better it does in the charts. So the more it's on the radio. The more it's on the radio, the more money they make. The more money they make, the more they can pump into advertising it. And so it's a, a very cyclical thing like that. Yep. Where And it's a huge, hugely complicated business model that people have really, really thought out. And it's like the Lady Gaga. I forget. There was an autobiography I was reading recently. I think it we might have been in... in Prodigy from Mob Deep, he went to a record executive thing and they were showing him Lady Gaga and saying basically this girl's going to be huge. I could have got that completely wrong, but it was definitely in a, a biography I was reading um, recently. Mm-hmm. Um, and what's, I mean, Lady Gaga's sort of one because basically they just completely changed her. They stole it off this woman called Lena Morgana essentially and like <laughs> cultivated her image. She went to school with Nikki and Paris Hilton. She's not a sort of down low, lower east side ruffian, used to take loads of drugs and uh, listen to disco music and be outrageous. That's the character that she essentially stole her identity from. And she doesn't really write her music. Red One writes the majority of her, uh, her music and Robert Fusari is the person that should be getting the money from him because they're the people that are behind the construction of her, the construction of her image. No doubt she can play the piano and can, you, she can hold a tune or whatever. I mean, this is the other thing that's really strange because people say, oh, it's crap though, isn't it? This music is rubbish. It's not. It's brilliantly, brilliantly constructed. It's constructed in a scientific manner. There are agencies that you can go to in LA and just by the sonic definition of certain songs, they can tell you whether that's going to be a hit or not. Yeah, it's all algorithms like, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you might know. I don't know what the term is for this, but Iron Maiden use it all the time. There's a way that you can basically go from a, a low pitch to a high pitch, and it goes like that. And so it does a sort of tick-shaped drop and raises. And that, basically, that's in every Iron Maiden song ever. Bruce Dickinson is a master at doing that. Mm. But that really resonates. It like sort of, It's like a, a tribal thing. It's like an instinctual thing that makes you, you sort of raise your hackles and go, oh, yeah. And it draws you into it. Mm. I mean, somebody like Katy Perry, for example, they basically gave her so many cracks, at, uh, but, you know, so many bites of the cherry. She was on the Warped Tour, the Vans Warped Tour uh, first, which is a skate punk festival. Why? <laughs> because she was doing a slightly different take on what she was doing. She was, and then they changed to marketing, and then they changed it again. And, you know, what they're going to do is eventually they're going to make her, or they're going to give you the impression that she's not this pop princess, but she's some sort of diva. That happened with Kylie Minogue, didn't it? There yeah. Was, there was a point yeah. where she was being marketed as this indie sort of chick, and <laughs> she was doing <laughs> tunes with Nick Cave and the Bad Seas. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. What, what makes me laugh about Kylie Minogue is that the thing that made her famous is her, 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 her butt, her, her, her ass in that video. <laughs> yeah. um, and it's not her. That's a body double. Yeah. Apparently, yeah. I, I've read it's a body double used was used in that video. So again, this this it's, it's ludicrous. This idea. I mean, that's another thing that happens in films all the time. There's oh, one yeah, specific yeah. girl that's been Britney Spears and Kylie Minogue and Christina Aguilera and all these different people mm. in, in various um, videos. But yeah. it, it's like an industry secret. Yeah. This um, I was watching um Stuart Lee um, the other day. He's a very good comedian, uh, English comedian, and he was explaining that basically. Certain very prevalent comedians within uh, the English television, who are still quite funny, uh, uh, like Frankie Boyle was one that he mentioned, so, though he said that this wasn't as, as used as much, Jack Whitehall, Ma- Michael McIntyre, um, Rod Gilbert, and all these people that sort of do this sort of uh, live at the Apollo, BBC stuff and all this, John Bishop and all these sort of safe middle-of-the-road comedians. Yeah. And he's got friends that he went to Oxford with that now work as writers, joke writers, for these artists. Yeah. 
and he's that's not me. he's not uncommon i mean like bob hope never wrote a single joke i know it's not quite the same he was just a performer and to, possibly to hide the fact that he was a spy if you you know believe certain <laughs> people but um but yeah th- this is the point the, the image of celebrities that is presented to you is, is very 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 fake he's not to be taken the most seriously but there was a blog that was put out by fred durst of limp biscuit uh, basically that the, the time when you know hot dog um uh, starfish and uh, chocolate fo- hot dog flavored water was um, doing really well, and like you know, they were huge everywhere. And he did this sort of blog or an interview where he's basically saying, "Look, <laughs> you know, everyone thinks this is brilliant. I'm in the video. I'm I'm in this Bentley. I've got all these beautiful girls surrounding me, and you know, I've got this uh, all this nice clothes on. I look like a superstar. And you know, when this video shoot's finished, I'm going to go home alone. I'm going to sit there alone for the next two weeks, and I'm going to cry myself to sleep every night. And this is, you know, completely contradictory to the image that is presented. Ready meal the- for one. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean. There's another very, very sort of um, good thing. Again, Dame Dash explains. He says, all right, let's just examine what a million-dollar record deal is, aside from the fact that that's a loan that people don't realize. Yeah. Particularly in the hip-hop industry, first thing you're going to need is a house because everyone knows you're rich, so you can't be staying like where you used to stay because you're going to get robbed. And also, <laughs> you've got an image to present. Then you're going to need a car. Then you're going to need some jewelry. Then you're going to actually need to pay, pay taxes, so you know, a certain amount of that's gone already. Then you're going to need to do this, 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 and this because you know, you've know you got to keep all your boys' suite around you and stuff like that. Maybe buy them some jewelry because you need a posse because that's the other thing. You can't... Mm you can't be seen as weak in this in this milieu but that's before we've even started promoting your album recording your album promoting you as an artist flying you to new york to do um uh, interviews on the breakfast show flying you over to la to do interviews over there and stuff like that yep. that's all paid for out of your million pound um advance or go. record contract yeah at the end of the day they are financing a, what a project not you you are an element of that project. They're financing a project, and the contract is set up in a way that they can't really lose. Because if you if you sell and you do well, you get a, a measly amount. I was watching uh, again. I was watching something the other day about Run DMC. They got something like seventy-one cents split between three three of them for every record sold. Mm-hmm. Jam Master J was not doing particularly well financially when he was murdered. Like again, this is outrageous because these are these are really brilliant artists that deserve to, to do well, but they didn't do particularly well off the music. Yeah. Um, strange, very strange. And the point that Dame Dash is making is essentially this million dollar record um, deal that you've got. I mean, this is this is hip hop, and it's a particular type of hip hop artist, so it's not necessarily accurate for all everybody. But basically. You're going to be about a quarter of a million dollars in the hole before you've even started. Yeah. And there's no guarantee of success. And then you, you can get into the other things like, say, people go, oh, wow, a million dollar album deal, five albums, that's amazing. Never sign that, right? Because what a five album deal means is that you owe this company five albums, that's but right. they have no obligation to record those five albums. So if your first album dies, right then tough you're on their roster forever you can't buy your way out of the contract unless you want to spend incredible amounts of money and you can't perform music or you can't write new music and put out new music because you're owned by this company yeah literally owned i mean that's what happened to even very very prominent artists like mariah carey and um george michael got locked into it. I mean, he, even Lou Reed got locked into it. I mean, he basically got out of it by doing Metal Machine, which was just a nonsense album. <laughs> like, but I don't think you can do that anymore. Mm. I think there are also obligations that you have to, pr- you have to uh, provide a certain amount of commercial success. Mm. You know, they, they expect to get to, re- to, to um, be reimbursed on their investment, and they expect to be reimbursed incredibly well. I mean, look at the, who's making the money out of, uh, of um, a genre. And it's not the artists, often. And it strikes me that if it's not one particular artist at the top of their tree, there's always <laughs> another one there to take their place. So, for instance, Jay-Z has been the number one hip-hop artist for forever, for, for God yeah. knows how many years. But if it wasn't Jay-Z, it'd be somebody else. It's not about Jay-Z. It's about that number one position being available. Jay-Z yeah. just happens to be 
filling that position. Well, I mean, but, but, but if something happened to him tomorrow, they they'd, they'd stick somebody else there, and you know, you got a new top dog in hip hop. It's, it's it's not about the individual; it's about yeah. the positions being filled. It strikes me. What's it called? Um, Professor Griff of Public Enemy suggests that basically, Jay Prince, Suge Knight, um, Dame Dash, and of Gotti were going to join together to make a distribution company. And um, I've heard that, yeah. I mean, I don't know if this is true. This is what I've heard from Professor Griff's videos. I've never met Blake. Um, and, uh, yeah, he was saying that it's very suspicious that the IRS raided all four of these people and made them all ineffective for a certain period of time. And it was at that time that Jay-Z managed to sli- sidestep a... Uh, I mean, that was a very strange thing as well, when he was supposed to have stabbed on Rivera and it blatantly wasn't him that did it. And everybody knew who did it and stuff like that. But he was still to put up... I mean, you could make the argument that maybe he was being tested or... Hmm. Who knows? But yeah, it's it's very strange. I mean, I'll just to say this, like, this, this that new program, isn't there? The founding of America, the Oliver Stone thing that's going on, and um, one of the quotes that that's that's made in on the advertisement for it is, "No man can make a million dollars honestly," and I think that's probably true. Yeah, it would appear to be the case. Yeah. Hmm. So looking at the current glut of so-called hip hop artists, uh, mm-hmm. inverted commas used today yeah uh, to what extent do you see many of the prominent ones being used for mind control and, and you know manipulation of of the perceptions of young people because that's what we're talking about well getting, i mean get, getting getting them young it's simplifying it that's that's one of the things that I mean, we, we spoke about this in relation to the sort of um, earworms and uh, ringtone beats and stuff like that but there's a real lowering of the tone of, of like a lack of lyricism and, and like particularly artists like Chief Keef and stuff like that and Two Chains and French Montana it's real bad stuff it's good it's like you were saying earlier it's good club music people want to dance to it and go oh yeah this is amazing but there's no substance or content to it yeah. and the, the other thing that's I mean there's two other things essentially one thing that I've noticed is at, at the minute is a real prevalence for uh, promotion of uh, MDMA or Molly. Yeah, Molly, yeah. And you know what's really strange about that? It's obviously, this is not a new drug. This was, um, you know, it's connected to raves and We're stuff like that. about it in 1988 in Britain. Uh, They've just caught yeah. up with it in the US. Well, what, what's strange, though, is, you know, when it was being talked about in Britain, it was Acid House and it was a love-based drug. It was yeah. a love and dancing drug. Yeah. Molly is a date, rape, and sex drug in, yeah. in hip-hop. That's what it's there for, basically. There's no talk about camaraderie or getting together with a load of blokes and hugging with your shirt off or any of this stuff that basically yeah. that it used to be sold on it's now either sold in songs like Rick Ross's you ain't even know it like put, put it in a champagne yeah yeah, yeah she ain't even know it like, and, or alternatively it's just in songs like you know I dropped a molly and I'm sweating or whatever hmm. but it's it's that hyper sexuality sold as like it's like catnip for women This it's like you know give, give her a bit of this and you'll be fighting her off with a you know with a stick, yeah. um, but and the other thing that, that's sort of irritating at the minute is the I mean this has always been prevalent with all artists I mean Frank Sinatra's manager paid girls to scream the Beatles managers paid girls to scream okay there's always been bought um, audiences and this goes into the, the sort of film thing as well when Tom Cruise um, there was a, a recently he was promoting uh, Mission Impossible three I think it was or four or one of the Mission Impossibles in India. Or one of his films, and basically there was a huge crowd there to meet him, and they were all chanting his name and stuff like that. And this was shown on the news, and a, a journalist who was there at the time was asking people, "Do you know who this guy is?" "No, we've got no idea. We've been paid thirty quid to come here and stand and read and shout this name off this board." Yeah. And so it's the concept of he's, he's boosting his ego, and he's also boosting the idea of him as an entity being successful because film stars are a project in the same way that the music stars are. Do you think but, the likes of Tom are in on it? Do they actually believe that people are, are screaming their name because they love them or do they know it's all a scam? I mean, these people aren't stupid and they, they understand the game. Hmm. So it's, it's very difficult to say uh, whether, you know, how much of it is fake and how um, sort of aware of it they are. Yeah. The, the sort of what's very irritating at the minute is um, they're doing all this sort of drug kingpin nonsense again. Like, um, and not particularly well like there's always been comparisons to drug campaigns and stuff like this, but all this Rick Ross and Jeezy and stuff like this, it's it's not believable. 
And we were talking before we came on air, one of the stupidest things that like Rick Ross just says is basically, oh yeah, Manuel Noriega, I know him personally and he owes me favours. And, and then he quantified that in an interview saying, well, I've never actually met him, but I knew some guy that was in a cell three doors down from him. And I started thinking about that. I said, I bet that's not true because obviously Rick Ross was a, was a CO, like worked in a prison and basically... Well, he probably used to serve his meals, didn't he? Yeah, exactly. This was, I was thinking, or, or, or basically was in a prison, worked in a Correctional prison. Correctional Officer Roberts. Well, this is what's so ludicrous. I mean, he's basically um, taken freeway Ricky Ross's identity. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that's a whole other story connected to the Iran Iraq Contra and the uh, yeah, Dark Alliance. And the, he was basically, freeway Ricky Ross was dealing directly with the sort of Nicaraguan uh, drug connections that were being sponsored by the CIA to finance the Iran Iraq war. And, it's, and then through him and a gentleman called Michael Harris or Harry O, they were the most sort of prolific importers of cocaine and spreaders of crack within the um, sort of black communities of uh, America. Hmm. Harry O was the chief financer of Death Row Records. So it all sort of goes round and round and round and round. And what was Death Row Records promoting? Gangster lifestyle, selling crack, hmm. being a gangster, just again, predictive programming. Yeah. Um, Putting it in the, I mean, that works both ways because, you know, it's me, it's horrible, really, because basically you're showing to a, a certain demographic that this is a way that perhaps you could make your situation better. And on the other time, you're terrifying another demographic, basically white America, so that they fear young black people. And then that sort of builds on itself to the point where these young black people are not being given a fair shot. There's, there's racism and stereotypes and stuff like that to the point where they say, well, you know what? If you think I'm a gangbanger, I'll show you a gangbanger. Banger. I'm going to bang harder than anybody, bloody. And so that becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. And so that's why it's so stupid about all these blatant, uh, like, falsehoods from Ricky Ross, and particularly. I mean, you've got artists like Nicki Minaj, who's for some reason has always got her tits out now, like, on everything <laughs> that she does. Like, like, it's like, oh, come on. And and she's sold as beautiful as well. And maybe I'm looking at the wrong girl, but, like, she. Uh, well, no, she, I, I beg to differ on that one as well, mate. Yeah. Well, fair enough. Good. <laughs> it's not just me then. But but I mean, I doubt she knows what bloody planet she's on most days. She she just screeches like a harpy. Like, and she's another one that basically she's she's not a, got a consistent style. She's actually a very talented rapper, although she did steal her image from Little Kim. Mm. Like, she you know she can she can rap. She's very very good. But then she does all this starship nonsense yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. And it, you know, from starships to all these hardcore tunes, "Kiss My Ass" and "My Anus" because it's finally famous and yeah, all this I sort know. Of stuff. It's, it's very it's, it's strange. But again, you know, you throw the web wide enough, and you're going to catch as many uh, as you as you can. Mm. But I mean, it's what is so silly is that these artists keep getting shown up again and again and again. Ricky Ross denies he's a CEO. DJ Vlad exposes him. To be fair, like um, Rick Ross then made his goons beat Vlad up and make him drink a champagne glass full of his piss. But you know that's about as gangster as he's ever got. And like, and, and even the concept of like, it's not a good thing to be a gangster or a drug dealer. That's one of the things that really sort of like confused me about that. that it's when madness, he got, isn't it? Like Snoop Dogg got, being a pimp and saying, "Yeah, I'm a pimp," isn't it great? He, no, it's he not. Got, when he got dropped from Reebok for basically insinuating that he might rape a, a, a girl, mm. I mean, aside from the fact that that is, again, they, they were acting like he was the first person to say that. That's not a new thing in hip-hop. Like, you can find, like, numerous... Uh, um, Eminem talked about it all the time. It's not uncommon. Like, he's on the first CNN album. Like, mm. duct taping her, tie her up, raping her, send you the videotape. It's it's not an uncommon thing to be used because you're talking about a, a gangster sort of lifestyle, whether it's true or not. It's the, it's the genre. Mm. But what sort of really confused me about that was they're dropping him because he's claiming to date rape a girl. His whole image is he's a murderer. <laughs> Like, do you know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying that it's not a, a, a despicable thing to say that you're going to rape a girl, mm. but he's built his entire career on saying I shift to massive amounts of drugs and I kill anybody that gets him away. Yeah. Like, they were okay with that. Exactly. Like, uh, it's just strange. And I again, call it, that's... I call it selective morality because uh, they'll they'll highlight a lyric like that and let so many others go. All these disgusting. Uh, just negative lyrics that you're getting in hip-hop records these days 
are just are just allowed to slip through the net and they'll just focus on one particular one. I, oh, you can't say yeah. that. Like Kanye West, what was it uh, on Jesus? He's talking about um, some lyric about going down on Asian women and you know the Asian community got all upset about that. Yeah. I was thinking, yeah. listen to the rest of the album. What well, he's exactly. bloody saying he's talking about yeah, Satanism yeah. and all sorts, and you're just letting it go. Well, I mean, it, 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 it's the normalisation of things as well, basically. They, they, people don't sort of assume that it's a... Uh, because obviously people live vicariously through artists and sports teams and all sorts of things. Because, you know, it's exciting. <laughs> but this sort of... The free and easy way that basically like artists sort of talk about, yeah, I've been to jail, blah, 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 blah. It's a very different experience when you get there, you <laughs> suddenly discover, yeah. well, I've got a chopper in the boot of my car and blah, 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 blah. That's odd, Rick, because you didn't have it when the gangster disciples shot up your car for basically, you know, overstepping the mark and claiming things that you that, that aren't associated with you. <laughs> it, 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 But, you know, it's ludicrous. It, it really is. Like, there has been a real shift away from lyricism and any type of social commentary or any type of um, you know positive message exactly to to real and I don't mind it I'd like nasty I like mob deep and stuff like that that's perfectly okay I don't like Rick Ross and stuff because I just think it's basic I think it's really bad music to be quite yeah. honest like and there are artists out there like you know immortal technique and, and various people like that that are still doing very good clever uh lyrics and, and good clever production and stuff like that but it sells an image to kids particularly young impressionable kids particularly young impressionable kids that come from a an area where they don't get a lot of love social support education opportunity it sells an image that seems so achievable and and stuff like that and and what's really irritating is that basically that's how that's the point of it so marketing strategy again i i'm not saying you should censor this or stuff like that but it's done in such a oh it's not what we meant to do oh no we're not glamorizing it oh god no of course not of course we're not glamorizing it how are you not glamorizing it you're wearing a mink coat with a golden ak-47 on the front of your <laughs> album like how could you glamorize it any any more yeah uh, and you know again I've got no particular problem with the milieu or the genre or stuff like that but I just think it's very very cynical it's about conspic conspicuous consumption uh, and immediate pleasures and it's just basic it's just base at the minute that's the problem with a lot of hip hop yeah really another area that interests me besides music is the use of Hollywood movies Mm -hmm. for predictive programming and planting of subliminal messages and that sort of thing. I know, yeah. you, I know you look into that as well. Could you maybe give us a few examples that you've uncovered of some of the strange stuff that um, has been implanted into movies to generate a certain uh, sort of psychological reaction in the audience? Well, I mean, we'll, just, we'll go on a basic one, really, is um, music. Like, um, the two most prominent um, soundtracks that you could probably think of or most famous is Jaws and Psycho yeah. and, and they use the very high pitched squeal or the very low rumble and what that's supposed to do is um, replicate or imitate um, animal sounds either like a growl in the case of the Jaws uh, score or a high pitched shriek uh, like maybe like an owl or something or sounding like an animal in pain in um um, in Psycho and it, the other thing is that they use sort of dissonance and they use uh, tension they use sort of they, they build tension and then release and build tension and release by um, the you know which, which particular notes that they're actually using at scale but it's yeah it, it, that's a very very um, prevalent thing that's why a film score is there a swell is there when the two main characters kiss uh, because it you know it, it builds on that thing I mean essentially it's a kind of hypnosis because People ask, what is hypnosis? And hypnosis, all hypnosis is really is, is a very, very pleasant state of relaxation where you, your subconscious mind can be accessed directly. Um, and, you know, it's going into daydream or driving along and realizing that you've missed your off ramp. Yeah. But it's okay because the autopilot took hold. And that's the same thing that happens when you get engrossed in a film. If you've ever cried at a film, t you've been subject to a very mild hypnosis because you know that that girl's not really dead. Like, she's an actor, but it has been conveyed in such a way that it's bypassed your logical, critical analysis, and you've succumbed to the emotion of the piece. And things like music, they work in a, in a number of ways in films. Like, one way is that they actually just basically 
block up your brain. Your brain's got a finite amount of sort of information it can take in. And so if there's music going on as well as other stuff, then, you know, you've only got a certain amount of thinking space left. And that's why they use Muzak in um, shopping centres. To, to basically just fill your brain and make make it even more confusing, so that you you sort of succumb to impulse buying. Yeah. But it, but in films, as I say, it paints a, an idea. You can tell somebody's a bad guy the second he comes on screen, if because they'll zoom in on his eyes and the music will go dun dun dun, <laughs> and everybody goes, oh, so he's the bad guy. Oh, brilliant. Okay, I I can understand that. There's certain um conventions and signs and signifiers that we we can decode but they're they're sort of presented in in a certain way that that again it's a constructed way some of them are archetypal um some some of them are are basically societal things where you know big handsome blonde geezer he's the hero or whatever usually it's like an ugly it's strange the amount of times that um you give a bad guy a, a physical deformity yeah, like like a James Scott Bond or, style. Yeah, exactly. But there are ways that you can you can make even a villain more attractive. You can give him a very um, a tr- uh, esoteric hobby, like Joker in the first in, in the Tim Burton's Batman. He's into art. Hmm. He's clever, isn't he? You know, this sort of genius villain guy, Tim. Um, Richard, yeah. Yeah, Tim uh, Gary Oldman in um, Leon. He's listening to classical music while she's going around and murdering people. So it's like, oh, fair enough. You know, and it's that sort of concept of the intellectual European that was in the Die Hard films and all, all of this yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah. Like, they, they, yeah, there are things that you can do to make make you like the villain. Hmm. Like, um, but again, these are these are Hollywood uh, conventions. Another one. This is used in Disney. Is the the if you want them to, if you want a character to be liked, you give them a tiny little button nose and huge eyes. <laughs> and again, it's because basically it's an instinctual drive. It reminds you of a baby, and so you're sympathetic. You're naturally maternal, paternal, whatever you want to call it. And and you know, so that so they actually respond uh, to it. And uh, and then there's more nefarious things. I mean, the obvious one is is uh, the use of the military. And the sort of the use of films to make the military look sexy, and there are things like Top Gun, uh, Zero Dark Thirty, um, Hurt Locker. These are all recruitment tools. They, these are all blatantly recruitment tools. Um, and then you've got other films like uh, The Siege, Courage Under Fire, True Lies, Executive Decision, and they very handily tell people who've never gone out of their front room. Uh, about geopolitics, hmm. who the bad guys are in the world. Oh, it's Muslims, isn't it? It's, it's Islamic fundamentalists, and they're likely to walk into a restaurant and blow themselves up, <laughs> just like they did in that Steven Seagal film. It's not Russians anymore. It's okay. Hmm. We're all right. They've, they've stopped telling us that Russians. Rocky sorted that out. So, you know, if we, if we can get it together, then all can get together, and I don't mind that you killed my friend. So, yeah. you know, that, yeah. that's how it works. This is where people get there. It's like we were saying earlier about the, the, the pictures that are painted in people's heads. You've never been to Egypt. You, you know what the Sphinx looks like because you've seen it, but perhaps you don't understand the, the, the dimensions of it, how big it is, sort of where it is in, in relevance to the pyramids or, or whatever. Hmm. That's not a criticism. It's just how, how else could you? But this is the problem. This is where you get a lot of racism, bigotry, homophobia, and all this nonsense. It's because it's an informed view of, of something that, that nobody's ever really come up to terms with. They've got an idea from stereotypes or from um, informed information from other people that have got it from informed sources and stuff like that. So mm. it, it's, it's very strange. The point about the, the use of the military in films... Um, is that essentially you can use their equipment, you, you can arrange to um, hire equipment from the US military certainly, and this is probably the case for other militaries as well. Certainly there seems to be an incredible quid pro quo going on with Top Gear and the uh, British military. They often have you know, very, very massive machines and stuff like that, yeah. and it's again, it's a very subtle way of saying, cool, look at that, I, I could be in one of those if I was in the military. Yeah. But, but so... You, you can use it in, in, say, Hollywood productions and stuff like that, but the, the, the rule is they get final rewrite of the script. And so in a series of John uh, Woo films, James Bond films, uh, James, uh, so James, uh, John Wayne films and the like, 
uh, films like uh, Meat, not Meatballs, Stripes, and uh, and various other Iron Man, Transformers. They've all got the backing of the military, which means that basically you can use their equipment, but you can't say anything that's detrimental to the military. And that film has to, in some way, be beneficial for recruiting. Yeah, there you go. So yeah, it, it, this is the thing, and people don't realise that. I mean, Iron Man's a very good one because it basically, it it not only again makes the sort of military look sexy and stuff like that. But it, it portrays them as the good guys in the end because they they finally get on Tony Stark's side. But it also sort of has the concept of fundamentalist Islamic terrorists as well. Yeah, it's in there as well. You know, so there is you you could. It, I mean, it's it, it's not even a, a a theory. It is a fact. I mean, and they get quite nefarious with it. Zero Dark Thirty and um, Hurt Locker by Catherine Bigelow. I mean, that's so obvious that she's actually received classified information. And the reason it's obvious is because senators complained about it. It's, it's a fact. It's in the, it's in the public domain. Mm. But the CIA and the U.S. military maintain to this day that they had no involvement with the production of those two films, which is it's provably not true because otherwise she wouldn't have had the access mm. to those documents. And probably, I think you'll probably find that, that a lot of the equipment that was used in it was, was again hired directly from the Department of Defense which goes against um, what they say so in that that's a wonderful piece of propaganda because it basically it fulfills all the things that they wanted to do um, say how cool the military is say how sexy the military is it also basically shows that torture is useful and it also shows that the CIA do it and there's nothing you can do about it, so be afraid. Yeah. And it also, for example, in Hurt Locker, hyped the concept of the, the belly bomb or the so-called belly bomb, you know, stitching a bomb inside somebody. Mm -hmm. So that led on to the, oh, well, that's a real situation, is it? Oh, we best have these x-ray machines in uh, yeah. um, airports. Yeah. Um, Came along just at the right time, that film. Exactly, it's odd, that, isn't it? But, yeah, yeah. Uh, but at the same time, they get that they get to stand there and go no 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 this is nothing to do with us no 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 I mean we appreciate what the young lady's done but I think she's misunderstood us so to get they get to have the cake and eat it too with those particular um, examples I mean Top Gun just to, just to sort of explain the power of these films the day after Top Gun came out a million people were, um, uh, joined up to either the Air Force or the Navy mm, madness mm. What do you make of the Bourne films starring Matt Damon? Because uh, th there's a hint there in the Bourne character himself that he may have undergone uh, what we've come to understand as MK Ultra mind control yep. treatment at the hands of the CIA. And uh, when you look into this subject area and then you go and watch those films, there seems to be a very clear indication at what's being hinted at in the plot. Uh, and I just wonder whether you think they do this so that researchers who genuinely look into MK Ultra and other similar uh, techniques, if you want to call them that, can be dismissed as yeah. uh, fantasists that watch too many movies and need to get out a bit more. Yes, yes. I mean, that, that's, it gives the plausible deniability, doesn't it? Because, mm. it, again, if nobody else has got... The, if the only knowledge that people have got of these techniques comes from the films of Manchurian Candidate... <laughs> excuse me... <coughs> and the Bourne Identity or the Bourne Trilogy, then the only knowledge that they have of it is the realm of science fiction. Yeah. And so this is the point. Who paints that picture? Until they're shown the documents and whatnot, and even when they are shown the documents, because they're coming from a completely different position, it takes a while to, to, to sort of come around to that point. I certainly took that from the Bourne films, uh, particularly in the last one where they're doing the water torture to him um you know where it shows the sort of the uh, origins of his um um of his uh training and whatnot i actually thought they were very good films like and um well they were yeah you know there's the there's also the sort of elements of the espionage things you know that the bit where he's, he's telling him how to avoid the cameras on the, the platform in the train station and such like that so you know yeah. very 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 sort of intricately done but as you said they do give that plausible deniability uh, close encounters of the third kind et all of this sort of stuff do you know what yeah. i mean like yeah. i mean that's even before you get into the sort of painting of certain events like the two two events that are basically painted and uh, in ways that that never had like um 
the son of Sam murders and um, the Charles Manson case. Like there's innumerable films about both of those things. You know, often sort of hidden behind schlocky horror titles and such like that. Sometimes not. Sometimes you know, like the Manson family or How to Skelter. Yeah, the Summer of Sam, Spike Lee film. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But they portray f- um, supposed facts about the case hmm. um, that aren't accurate. That just really aren't accurate at all, and you you can use films to um to really you know shift people's perception. There's a film that was on last night called The Wee Man, and it's about um, Robert Ferris, I think. It's a gangster involved in the ice cream wars in Glasgow, and I was deciding whether to watch it or whatever, um, and um, so I went on IMDb looking at all the reviews and stuff like that. And one of the things I said is, is be aware that this was written with the cooperation of the of the main character, so it's incredibly biased towards him and paints him as more of a Robin Hood fi- uh, uh, character rather than the villain that he was. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, even something as as simple as that just shows you how, how th- perceptions can be altered. And then imagine if you've got the the, in, the sort of infinite budget of the military behind that. Mm-hmm. Reminds Independence me of the- Day. Was yeah. it was another one. I mean that that you know, <laughs> the people wouldn't assume that that was utilised as a as a um, uh, an advertisement for the military because you know it's just a fun space aliens film, isn't it? But you know that's the point of it, isn't it? Yeah, reminds me of uh, what you were saying about Whitewash's the Notorious film about Notorious B.I.G. Oh uh, God! And you look at the credits: executive producer one Sean Coombs, aka well, Puff uh, Daddy. Uh, so. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the depiction you get of Puff Daddy in, in the movie and the role that he played in Big's life could yeah. be just a little bit kind of uh, manipulated, well, it, don't you think? It altered several things. He didn't explain why um, Sean Puffy Combs actually was fired from his first job mm. because he and Heavy D put on a ba- uh, concert That's right, uh, yeah. at a school uh, and they oversold the tickets and some kids died. Yeah. And, you know, it was blatantly, or it certainly appeared yeah, to be. Yeah, they left that bit out, didn't they? Yeah, they seemed to leave that bit out. They seemed to leave all the stuff out about Shine and the way that he just completely rolled on him. Um, I mean, one of the things that they didn't talk about, certainly in the film, is that that's one of the reasons the Biggie Smalls was broke, is because you use Sean Puffy Combs' studio, that's he's going to charge you for that. You use the equipment in his studio, he's going to charge you for that. You've got to use his in-house producer... But he's going to charge you from that. He gets an executive producer credit. That's why on every single song with that's on the Bad Boy roster in the background, you've got uh-huh. um, P yeah, Diddy. Goes, right. Yeah, uh, uh, Bad Boy. Like, yeah. <laughs> thanks. That's thirty seconds of your life. He gets uh, a, a writer's credit for that, and he gets a performer's credit for that. Is that what it then, is? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You then in the um, uh, doing the video, hypnotized, for example, seven million. Okay, that comes directly out of. Uh, his pocket, Biggie Smalls's pocket, but he wasn't told that until after the fact. All the clothes, etc., everything that's in the in the um, um, the, the thing. You, his Bentley, Puff's Bentley, was in that. Not only did he charge for that, but he was able to write that off as a tax deductible thing for his company. Hmm. Um, and so this is the point. All this money is going out and going out and going out, and and you swindled every way up. I mean, the, again, these artists basically make made. Very, very small amount of money off uh, f- compared to the, the record labels. Yeah. Sean Puffy Combs, not a man you'd want to be on Judgment Day. No. Any- anyway, <laughs> moving on. Uh, on the subject of hypnosis, uh, yeah. this is a bit of a wild card question, but I just wonder what you make of Darren Brown, because uh, yeah. when a lot of people think of hypnosis, they think of Darren Brown. He's the best known character in that field. I don't know if you know him personally, but yeah. th- th- there's a couple of points I want to raise about him, but I just wondered what your overall impression was of his work, what he does. Um, I, it's quite entertaining. Some of it I, I prefer more than others. I'm not particularly into magicians and, and that sort of thing because it just irritates me because I just sit there and go, well, how has he done that then? Well, I've got to figure it out. And obviously you, you never can, so yeah. <laughs> it just winds me up. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, he's quite good. I mean, he, he uses a variety of techniques, um, NLP and um, subliminals and, and, and various stuff, and he's incredibly, incredibly talented at it. Hmm. Uh, some of it. This is the other thing that's, that's strange about Darren Brown is he mixes... Um, uh, reality-based tricks with editing tricks. For right. example, like the one where he did um, Russian Roulette. That was that was done th- and through 
uh, the edited it. It was a camera trickery rather than an actual. Because they presented that as live, didn't they? They say it's, yeah, they said exactly. it's actually happening right now. And the lottery one as well, I believe. They, they did something like that. So that's where he sort of he muddies the water and stuff like that. Um, and so it's difficult to know. It's very difficult to know um, whether it's to what degree it is entertainment. Hmm. Well, he is a fascinating character to me and obviously a great showman and entertainer. Uh, yeah. as evidenced by anyone that's ever seen ever seen him out of character you know if you see him just being interviewed and he's himself not Darren Brown the showman but just the guy he's a yeah. very, very different character to the one you see on stage and he's never made any secret of the fact that what he does is all an act and he, he's quite open about that and he's also known for being an atheist and a Richard Dawkins fan he says there's no such thing as the paranormal or the supernatural everything he does can be explained logically uh, and it just makes me wonder whether he really believes that or if that's some kind of deceit or, you know, some part of the act. Oh, who cares what he thinks? He's entitled to his beliefs and stuff like that. Like, I'd never be so arrogant as to say I definitely know this does or does not exist. So, you know, who knows? Like, it's, it's, it's a tricky thing, but that's the whole point. That's kind of the... Um, it's, it's a Benazian thing, really. He's presenting a character on television because he's got to have that sort of authoritarian third-party advocate. You've got to believe his I identity. You've got to believe that he's the sort of person that could do this sort of thing. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, he won't be as effective. He's, and that's, part, that's partly showmanship. Mm -hmm. And that's partly to do with some of the techniques that he uses. You know, the, the sort of NLP and the hypnosis, stuff like that, because he's got to project confidence um, you know, in order to make it work, essentially. Um, I mean, it, it, again, it's, it's really strange. It, it, it's like the plausible deniability thing that you did, because a lot of the, the stuff they do, is, you know, the getting people to confess to murders, yeah. uh, the getting people to rob a bank, and the Sirhan Sirhan experiment. Hmm. This is the point where it comes about the muddying of the waters, because is that showing you that yes, this can be done? I mean, I mean the police thing—that's not uncommon that's particularly in third world countries and stuff like that they'll combine it with beating you up obviously but there's been innumerable cases where people have confessed to crimes that they haven't done for whatever reason yeah well you brought, um, you brought up sorry. The, sorry you brought up the Sirhan Sirhan thing and my main reason for bringing up Darren Brown was because I wanted to get on to this program mm. that he did uh, investigating mind control and it actually touched on MK Ultra by name and it yeah. suggested that it was a CIA sponsored project this is something being put out prime time on channel 4 not well, I mean, something, that's, not, that's not something true, you, you know? yeah not something you hear often on mainstream TV and it included footage of Sirhan Sirhan claiming that he had no memory of shooting Bobby Kennedy at all to this day he just doesn't know what happened to him he thought and, he was at shooting range apparently yeah and and the program ended up giving the viewer the idea that MK Ultra mind control is very real. That's mm. probably what was done to Sirhan Sirhan and any number of others. And it ended up presenting a pretty plausible case for the idea of mind-controlled assassins. And that, yeah. to me, was an incredible thing to see on mainstream TV. Well, yeah, I mean, but that's that's what was so interesting about it. I mean, just to sort of clarify, MK Ultra is real. It's, a, it's an admitted project. Hmm. Uh, there was 149 sub-projects. It was later renamed um, MK Search. There were other um, MK Naomi, MK Delta, MK QK uh, Hilltop, MK Chickwit, MK Derby Hat, uh, Artichoke, Chatter, and Bluebird all preceded it. These are all real... Um, projects and that and the one of the the points of this was to create what could be called as the manchurian candidate or a mind controlled assassin and there were numerous methods that they experimented with and there were actually numerous methods which were provably um successful and the second point that i want to make is that basically um sirhan sirhan was under hypnosis i don't believe he was the person that did shoot uh, robert kennedy uh, and I mean, certainly this. Uh, oh, I forget who wrote the book. Um, uh, it's a very good book called *The Assassination of Robert F. Kennedy*, and I can't remember who wrote it. Um, but but people should look it up. And they postulate in that that basically um, it was a hypnotist called. Um, oh God, I'm forgetting everything. Joseph Bryan. Um, let me just try and find it actually. Uh, yeah, Joseph Bryan Jr. I think was the was the, William Joseph Bryan Jr. Sorry, and he was basically the head of the uh, American Psychiatric or uh, Hypnosis uh, Association at the time, and they postulate um, in this book that basically he was uh, the the person that actually um, programmed Kennedy, um, 
Sirhan Sirhan. And what's certainly true was examined by a lot of hypnotists after the fact. Heiss and Spiegel were the two famous ones that actually examined him. And they all concluded that he was uh, in a hypnotic trance at the time. Mm -hmm. And he exhibited certain... Uh, things that, that aren't normal he was incredibly strong and seemingly impervious to pain like he's a very tiny guy and it took about eight people to wrestle him to the ground um, and he also had the uncanny ability to basically tell the time accurate to the second with no access to a watch wow. which is which is the sort of thing that you might see in sort of stage hypnotism or something like that yeah yeah really but the the point about the um uh, the Darren Brown thing is now it's in the milieu of, or the, in the arena of uh, entertainment. So it's one of these strange things where it basically says, "Yeah, of course, yeah, it's real. We've we've told you about that. We've never denied it." But at the same time, it it's like, "Oh yeah, yeah of course, Darren Brown made that happen." In the same way that David Copperfield flew, like it's an illusion. Neil, grow up. What's wrong with you? Yeah, can it you can't not really the, be done. Yeah, can you not tell the difference between reality and it's this meshing of mm. of things that basically. Yeah causes this confusion really properly messing with your mind mm. and it's been going on forever <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right neil well as we start to wrap things up then are there any upcoming talks or media appearances you'd like to plug uh and also just just give a quick mention for your books and details of where people can get hold of those and find further information about your work sure uh, well I'm, I'm appearing at a couple of truth juice venues uh, in the future truth juice um uh, Hull and Truth Juice Leicester um, so uh, you know go on their websites and their Facebook pages and, and, and check it out um, if anyone wants to get hold of my books it's Your Thoughts Not Your Own Volumes 1 and 2 Volume 1 is it's sort of nuts and bolts of MK Ultra and Tavistock and um, you know Manchurian Candidates and Hypnosis and different doctors involved and assassins and spies and serial killers and all of this sort of stuff so it covers quite a lot and this, the second one talks about social control and the use of the media the use of the entertainment industry the use of uh, the film industry and then it, it sort of rounds up talking about um, the LS D explosion in the 60s in, in Hay Ashbury and the sort of connection to the military and MK Ultra that that, that has. Um, if anybody wants to, to um, get them the, or just see any other videos and stuff that I've done or, or radio shows, you can go to my website, which is uh, neilsandersmindcontrol.com. Uh, and I also have a Facebook page, uh, which I update daily. I'm usually on there basically ranting about something. Um, so if anybody wants to get in touch with me through that or if they'd like to like the page, that would be very um, uh, much appreciated. And so, yeah, you can uh, get in touch with me like that. Okay, brilliant. Thanks for coming on today. It's been a trip.